do not know why we are here. We do not know who built the silo and why we are underground. We only know the world outside our sanctuary is death. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. So, Rebecca, I was I was giving access to all 10 episodes just a couple of days uh, before You're this one interview. of them. You're the lucky one. Uh, yeah. And now, uh, okay, I'll, I'll watch as, as many as I can. I don't, I don't know if I have time to watch them all. I could not stop. <laughs> I could not shut it really? off. Oh, my God. I love it when I show really? catches. Yeah, really, really. I'm so into it. <laughs> I oh, watched them man, all. Oh, man, I love it. I love it. Oh, no. Come back. You, you should promote the movie or the show. <laughs> Julie, it's such a complex character. She's an engineer. She's an investigator. She's a natural leader. And she's fearless, but she's so as vulnerable as anyone else under this oppressive regime, right? So yeah. how was it for you to find all of those facets to Julia? I mean, all of those facets. And like you said, she's a born leader. And I think what's interesting and kind of captures what you said, she's a not chosen natural born leader. Right. And that's what makes her interesting. It's the fact that she speaks the truth that is her truth. And it's not a forced truth. It's not wanting to stand on the barricades and screaming for screaming's sake. It's the realization throughout the journey that something is not right. And therein lies the fear and the love and the vulnerability of needing to find out what it is because I have nothing left to lose. You know, that's right. always interesting when you get to a point with a character when you have nothing left to lose. How far yeah. are you willing to go and you become the biggest threat? Wow, yeah, it's an it's amazing character. I love her. <laughs> I need to find out the truth. <laughs> they were like, is he going to be a Jovi nerd or value nerd? I was like, oh, <laughs> do you speak Portuguese? Then? Yeah, yeah, I speak Portuguese. Yeah. Oh, que legal. <laughs> Prazer. Prazer. Uh, can we do this in Portuguese, guys? Uh, I don't know. There's like, there's. Okay, no, I, they asked me to, to keep it in English. Okay. They, 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 you know, they're keeping me. They're yeah. keeping me. Yeah, right, right. Okay. <laughs> <See? laughs> so, uh, Avi, I love Lucas so much because he represents the most basic of human curiosity. He has the most profound questions. I love the fact oh, that man. he's like mapping out the night sky and they don't know what that is. So I think that's so deep, man. I mean, oh, uh, so you, I, I love this. How was for you to like to build this character? It's such a powerful message throughout the, you know, this whole situation they're in. I love that you said that. I That's exactly how I sort of approach this. I go, oh, this guy, really just follows his curiosity and his heart and he just dreams you know and you know i did like the, the the technical research things and went out and looked at the night sky and sort of thought well this will just let me understand where the constellations are but actually laying out there one evening in cold cold england i sort of went you know what this is unbelievable that we sit on this rock that spins around and we're looking at things that are millions and trillions of miles away that have been there before yeah. we ever existed. And the people hundreds of years before us were looking at the same stars and the scope of that and the way that it sort of puts you back as, you know, to be a very fortunate, lucky thing that exists here. Uh, it was really fascinating to me. And then to, to play a character that recognizes that from being underground in the silo and in recognition of that still goes and i want to know more and i want to discover and i want to wonder there's a lovely thing to play and i think it's a right. lovely thing to have in a story like this i love that you went through all that yourself and you asked the questions he was asking right uh, it's amazing. well you know it's because i'm like a pessimist man if I <laughs> you know i don't want to look at the stars i want to you know i don't know go to cinema and have a dinner but i was like, I should understand a bit. Hi, Harriet. Hi. Nice to meet you. Martha is such an interesting character because, you know, she lives in this, you know, not leaving her shop for over 20 years. It's such an interesting uh, situation regarding that they live already in a confined society and she has created the confinement within the confinement. So how was for you to build all this intricate uh, worldview that she has? In a way, it's that idea that exactly that idea that in a way, if you're already in a kind of prison of a kind, then in a way I can understand making your own little 
world within that prison. I, I can right. something something seems to be logical about that. I don't even know what it is. In terms of building the character, I had to give myself a reason why I'd done that in the past, and also there is a sense in which we sort of find ourselves in a situation twenty years down the line. We didn't plan it. It's kind of grown up. I don't think she went into that room and said, I'm going to stay here for 25 years. I think she went into the room and bit by bit by bit, the world right. comes down and One day at a time. turned around and then she can't go out because it's been so long now. And I think that's quite a good metaphor for the way, you know, you can get to an, an age where you go, what made me do this and why am I still doing it? Right. Um, but also there's a certain sense in which in order to keep going in this silo, everybody has to shut down their vision. They have to kind of close their eyes and, you know, sort of believe what they're told. Because if you can imagine, you know, the biggest distance you have to look across is maybe, I don't know, a quarter of a mile. I don't know the actual dimensions, but what I mean is, you know, you, you don't actually see a, a horizon physically. Yeah. Um, and so that must affect the brain. That must affect the way we think. If you boil the pact down to one rule, it's do not say you want to go outside, or you will go outside. I'm good, man. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good, Roger. good. So what, you know, you you have the society that was, it was boiled down into submission, and people have to, you know, this is survival, this is how we survive. But you have those main characters, they have this drive to disrupt this status quo, although it's dangerous and not uh, interesting for the, their health. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you think that drives Paul into this situation? It's such a good question because I think the interesting thing about Paul is I don't think he's a disruptor in his nature, but he has this sense of moral truth. He wants to believe in something and he wants to believe in it because he knows it's right. And that is almost his, that's what, that's the little key. And so when Juliet starts asking these really good questions that don't have simple answers, he cannot just push it aside. And that curiosity, I think, is both his gift and what makes his life a little harder. Hey, good to see you. It's so good to see you. Uh, first of all, uh, Graham, uh, the very first trailer I downloaded on the internet back in 96, Broken Arrow. I have a connection with this movie. But what if the enemy is one of them? What the hell are you doing? I love that I'm here talking to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> uh, Hugh, I mean, dude, like self-published author, Look at this. How about this, man? <laughs> I was told this is not supposed to happen. <laughs> I feel joy for the success, man. Graham, what is the like what's the golden rule of making a good adaptation? What do you think? You got to love the source material. You got to there's I mean, I this I've worked on an Elmore Leonard show and that's what we call Justified because we all loved Elmore Leonard. So do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I just love these books. I felt that there was enough material to give us a bunch of seasons and I could kind of see what the first season would be. And just, just do that. Just bring that to life. There's stuff we have to add to get 10 episodes for the first season. But Hugh was there in the in our first mini room and then later on in the larger room, you know, just pitching away hard like all the other writers. And so <laughs> just how can we bring this thing to life? And how is it for you, uh, this experience, uh, Hugh, uh, being there in the writer's room and, you know, pitching in? The, your story pitched to yourself as well. <laughs> it's been a dream. It's, you know, when you write a novel, you're, you're on your own. You have no one to talk to, no one knows. Even if you had a question, no one knows the world that you're, you have the question about. But when you get into this room, some of the writers in the room know the world better than you do because they've been going through the book with sticky notes and <laughs> making, you know, detailed outlines. And so it's almost like you have a hobby that you have no one to share it with. And then you walk into this room and now you can all speak the same language and geek out about how much you love this character and that character. So I, I've never felt more welcomed and more in like company than I did in that in that situation. All this discussion about this society on the brink of extinction and the only way they know how to survive is like through total control, right? It's tight, you know, squeeze your hands. I know that you're a big Star Wars fan. And then I was thinking about, you know, uh, when Princess Leia is talking about, you know, sque Tarkin squeezing his hand so tight that his, you know, the systems start to slip out through his fingers. The more you tighten your grip, Tarkin, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. Did you 
envision something like this? Yeah, definitely exploring that. I what I find fascinating is people usually go like all the way to Hobbes and say you have to have that tight control for humanity to to get along. And the other extreme, people say if you just let everyone be themselves, it'll all work out. And I, I find both of those extremes、uh, highly unrealistic. And the 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 life that we navigate politically, socially, interpersonally. Is in between those, and everyone falls somewhere, you know, differently in, in in between those two extremes, and that liminal space is so fun to explore. And I think that's what you know society is, and that's what good fiction should、uh, should comment on. Hey, hi, Tim. Hello. What an honor, man! I mean, I'm such a fan. So it was a good surprise for me to have you on the show. I mean, it, it's such a powerful character. I think Bernard, such an interesting character because you know, in this society, it's all control freaks. You know, everything's about survival, and he's like head of IT. He's in the position of power, and it's such an interesting way to you know his worldview. How was it for you to build this character? I loved it. I loved the team that Graham Young's assembled. The directors, the writers, the actors, the crew members had a blast doing this. The character、uh, Bernard is a character I've played a little bit in the past, but not to this extent. I mean, this guy's very much behind the scenes, and he's a powerful man. He's in control of the IT network in the silo, so essentially all the functionary elements of the society run through the computer system. So he's essentially got ten thousand lives in his responsibility. What I've always been fascinated with by people in these kinds of positions of power. Is the de- degree to which they will compromise their own integrity or morality for the greater good, and they always do this with a huge veneer of virtue.、Um, yes,、right. I understand what you don't understand, and therefore we have to make these difficult decisions. Even though it will compromise your freedom, it's better that we do that because we won't survive if we don't. And throughout history, those kinds of people have been making decisions for people and have affected their lives in various ways. And always, the people come around to one thing, which is the heart, the truth in the heart, and that's essentially what guides Rebecca's character yet throughout this story. That is the essential disturbance, and that's what I love about the story too. Is Her agenda isn't a political agenda. Her agenda is to find out who killed her love. Yeah, it's injustice. It's a、right? detective story. It's something、yeah. she is on a mission because of her heart. Some mysteries are best left unsolved. What's going、it's、on? How you doing? You. <laughs> you good? Go. Good, good. I gotta say this: there, there is no better person to represent the turtleneck movement than you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so. I mean, it's so intimidating and awesome. And I mean, and that is your wardrobe, by the way, right? <laughs> yeah. Yo, I gotta say, man, I was really, I was really happy when when we went through the process of, you know, what would Sims be wearing, what would my character wear, and we came to that. Leather jacket and turtleneck. That is awesome. It just felt so good for Sims and like if you notice in the silo, he the only one with the leather with the leather jacket. You know that, right? 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 Yeah. I mean, I gotta respect that, man. <laughs> Sims is such an interesting character because you know it's tough guy. He really, I mean, you oh, okay, this guy. I don't want to cross paths with this guy, and then you get to you know know more about him and his family and, and his beliefs. And and the thing is, he really believes what he's doing, his mission, and that makes him such more interesting, right? But what do you think about that? Yes, I mean, Sims. Believes in what he's doing and believes is the right thing for the whole, for the people. In this story, you're not coming across a person who is just out to to kill people or to or to hurt people. Yeah, people right.、Like. So it kind of hopefully gives you another understanding, but to a person that is in that position or someone who who does make those choices, you still may not agree, or you may. But I but I love that you know. I've had friends who who knew the character I was playing, and, and you know I would tell them some of the scenes I was doing, and they'd be like, "Oh, you the bad guy." And then <laughs> when they see when they see the show, when they see Silo, they like, "Oh man, you know." <laughs> yeah, how about that? More than that, it's not it's just, more than that. Yeah, that, and that's what I love about Silo is that we is not he's not just bad guy, good guy. It's like you got 
these human beings, complex human beings living in this difficult situation of a silo where it's only yeah. 10,000 people alive. Right. And you're right. underground and you can't go outside and you're being told to, this is how you have to live. And it's classism there, but there's no records of history or remembrance of what some of the things that existed that we have. So it's a real interesting and intriguing and entertaining world and Sims is just a part of it, and I love playing this character. What you said, it's very complex characters, they're very human characters, even if they're doing something wrong, they believe what they're doing. What do you think that of like this ultimate drive that makes people question things and go against all this order so the Sims keeps hammering them down what do you think there is that you know make people you know drive their questioning to you know well, I think questions? um man people we have God instinct you know the creator lives in all of us and when you have that you know it's sometimes something greater than what you may be told I knew it was something greater like I grew up on the south side of Chicago I might have been told yeah you could do this and do that I felt like it was something greater for me than what I was told I could be or do. I think people have that instinct because they follow in their hearts and, them, and, their, and their instincts, their gut, to know, man, like it's something else that exists. You just know it, like it's one of those things. And I think, you know, we as human beings have that quality and we, if we, when we pay attention to it and are not smogged by the distractions or news that that's reported that's sometimes false or, you know, just the fears that, that are pumped out there, we, we are able to access that instinct and, and become the, the Juliets of the yeah. world. <laughs> nice, that's a great answer. Are you willing to give everything you have for this? Uh, Hugh, uh, are you like a video game guy? Everybody, everybody, you know, obviously compares. I'm a game guy, so you think, well, you can describe this series to someone who haven't watched or haven't read the book. So, Fallout. oh, it's some, something like Fallout. I mean, I even saw on the production like this Battlestar Galactica vibe because of the old computers and all these, you know, paranoia. So, uh, yeah, how would you describe this for you know a uh, uh, person who's coming in right now? Yeah, for me, uh, you're gonna get to step into my childhood, basically. This is a mashup of so many influences. Comic hey, you're an 80s guy, right? Be Right. Yeah, video games. Uh, the the Cold War fear of like we have to get underground because the world's gonna blow up. Like all of that is distilled into this. How about you, Graham? Uh, what's your take on it? Well, I haven't played a lot of video games, so <laughs> this doesn't really compare to Duke Nukem. Let's just say that. Okay. I'm going old school. Um, I love I, that game. I uh, Duke Nukem's a great game. In Duke Na Nukem is a great game because it's funny. I'm Duke Nukem, and I'm coming to get the rest of you alien bastards. Uh, the the silo world. There's a lot of humor within. I love people who are in a pretty grim place in many ways, and they just figure out a way to make a life and carry on. And then there's those some people who just start trying to solve the mystery. And that right. Just, you know, and both you guys, if you, ha I mean, if you, if you were to be locked up, like I, was, like I am here right now, uh -huh. <laughs> today, and you could like smuggle in one relic from our world, have you thought about what would that be for you guys? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a really good question. I, I mean, I just, for sentimental sake, I'd have to be a Pez dispenser. <laughs> I think for me, it'd be like, you know, the works of Shakespeare or something like a, a, a book that you could spend a lifetime with and never get all of it out. That's a better nice. answer than the Pez dispenser. Pez is delicious. Pez don't believe in the Pez. Oh, oh, that's an that's the best question I've had. <laughs> um, do you know what? I would take the Alchemist. I think with me. Paulo oh, Coelho. Really, Paulo I Coelho? Yes, ah, I know um, him. That book when I read it at a time in my life was really important to me and it's not, you know, it's an amazing book and this isn't about the literature of it or the whatever, but what it meant to me, you know, which is why I think books are so important. They mean something to us at different times in our life. Um, so if you locked me away today, I think I'd want mm -hmm. to hold on to that and, and the memory of where I was when I read that book and what my wow. life was. And, Powerful, man. Do you know what? My first response, which I might not need to smuggle in, I might just have to teach them how to make it. <laughs> was peanut butter. Oh, I was like, right. we're not making peanut butter, like, I'm not gonna last long. I need it. Right. Lily and Marshall were fighting about peanut butter. If there's anything else. That's such a good question. I don't know. I don't know. Nice. Do you know one thing I don't have that I am not at least clear on is it seems recorded music. 
right. Having the ability to yeah. carry with you music, right. Even that small detail, I'm like, I guess headphones. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. All, there's so many things that you take for granted. They're like, wow, I, music is such a big deal in my life. So. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> really funny. <laughs> really funny. I think I'd smuggle in some beautiful piece of music. Uh, you know, um, beautiful piece of I don't know Mozart or something. Nice. <laughs> Probably uh. A record player. Uh, yeah. I, I, love, uh, I love records, but I mean, I would have to have records too. So that would be more than one item, but I was, I was smoking more than one. Uh, right. <laughs> awesome. It's probably some photographs and a copy of a book called Dererum Natra by Lucretius. It's called The Nature of Things. Right, nice. I would take that into isolation and memory. <laughs> Oh, buddy, that's the whole, what would you bring to an island kind of thing? Oh. Right, there's the same question. Ah. <laughs> Have you asked other people that? Yeah. Give me something, give me something. Uh, like uh, music or books or like, uh, uh, I've, I've been told about, you know, The Alchemist from Paulo Coelho. <laughs> yeah, but The Alchemist is good and once you've read it, you've read it. So you need something. Right, like I agree with that. Right? And once you read it, you've read so, it, right? <laughs> and the issue is you can bring movies in, but then you need the whole movie device. You need to be able to watch, but you need something that can contain for a long time. And right. when it's done, you go back again <laughs> and it needs to shape history. I mean, I'm not religious, but if there was the Bible or something, I'd bring all all volumes. All Do you know volumes. what I mean? We need, right. but not. I would not bring a Bible at all. Not yeah, my right. belief, but something like that. Right. Something fundamentally huge. Right. Right. That's that's a good answer. <laughs> uh, Game Boy. Or <laughs> even better. <laughs> Do you remember the Donkey Kong? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> that's fun forever. I mean, I'm, as long as I don't need anything Kong. else. <laughs> Donkey Kong. New for Game Boy. So uh, if you were to be in this dire situation or I don't want to give much of the show away, but you know, that's a situation of if, if you go outside, you are you have the opportunity and the option to clean or not. Do you think you, Rebecca? Would you clean? <laughs> well, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because <laughs> I don't want to give anything away. No, don't give anything no, away. No, 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 no I won't. <laughs> um, but the philosophy and the actually the fundamental view of the cleaning and the wool is so interesting because it's sort of the idea is to wash away the view, the access point for the silo outside, but it's also the fundamental idea of, of taking the wool of someone's eyes, you know, the deceiving, the deceivingness of something. So it has so many aspects of it. It depends on who I am. Right. The moment of exit, if I right. am to exit. Uh, it's a tricky one. <laughs> Do you? See? Oh, that's a tr I haven't thought about it. It's just more easy to ask. I do, I do <laughs> half. I do. Right. That's a, a good answer. Corner, so it's just a little bit annoying for people with OCD. Right. Just a little bit. Um, if I was in this situation, I would clean because I would feel like I'm doing it for the people to see what does exist. I, right. I would think I was doing it for the right reason and doing it and for the, you know, for the love of the people. So I, if I was in that situation, I would do it. I would clean. Wow, that's nice. <laughs> wow, that's a really hard question. So, Chinaza or Paul? No, Chinaza. <laughs> if I knew what I know now, ah, right. if I knew what I know now, I would have the hope that I would find some way to communicate a message. If I cleaned, that I'd be able to like wow. communicate a message through the cleaning cool. in the way I cleaned. You know, <laughs> right. It be about can I communicate some sense of truth to these? It is the greatest audience you'll ever have. Right. Everyone's yeah. watching you. Everyone's watching. It's yeah. such a, a, a crazy situation, right? Crazy. So yeah. <laughs> it also but, feels like uh, the Roman Colosseum also. So you totally. feel like a human, yeah. yeah. Hmm, that's a big question. <laughs> yes, it is. I would probably clean if I'd set up a, a, a clue, rather like uh, Holston does, you know, Alison does. I would set up a clue that at least one person would would know what I was saying. 
right. with this gesture, <laughs> you know, but to just do it without anybody knowing what I was doing, you know, to have everybody believe that I was in some way complying or, you right. know, that would be terrible. But uh, so I think, I think, <laughs> yeah, I'd have to tell one person That's what, a good answer. What, what it meant. <laughs> I like to think that I would not clean. Everyone says that, man. But, Everyone, says, <laughs> yeah. Everyone says they're not going to clean. And what yeah, happens? They clean. They clean. <laughs> why do why do you think they do? Well, you have to watch the all ten. Ah, good. There you go. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Thank the you. series Thank is you. awesome. It's, uh, yeah, it's awesome. Thank man. you so Thank much. Congrats, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Rebecca. You were amazing on the show and everything is awesome. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you so much. The gear is safe. And there is not.